Hello, Tone. How are you? How's your New Year's been, Tone? Uh, good. Good. Uh, the the year is starting off very busy already, which is uh, <laughs> not ideal. But yeah, lots of uh, lots of things are looking to be launched in the near future. So I've been working on that. Lovely. So uh, let's start off. We have a few people listening, and I'm quite sure a lot of others will join as we go along. So, guys, welcome back. Uh, happy New Year to each and every one of you, and hope 2024 brings a lot of prosperity and a lot, lot of success in your lives, uh, as well as a lot of uh, nice transaction for all of us from uh, Bitcoin and other asset classes. Uh, today's space will be mostly focused on Bitcoin, as it's a comeback space for us. We have been away for quite a while with the Events, uh, foreign conference, conference table, and uh, financial summit in Dubai. Uh, everything has been way too busy, and we are coming back in the new years uh, with all these news that's uh, that, that 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 has also come through in the last couple of months, couple of weeks, and now we are getting closer and closer to the inevitable. So, Tone, I want to start off uh, with where we are in the markets in terms of Bitcoin. First of all. Are we where you expect us to be at the at this junction where we are so close to ETF approval? Well, we are a little bit. I mean, the price. Of, I'm very happy with the current price of Bitcoin. I think the price of Bitcoin is actually higher than I expected it to be at this stage. However, when I expected it to be at this stage, I did not anticipate us to be this close to ETF approval. So factoring in the news of the ETF approval, uh, it is possible that Bitcoin is a bit undervalued. Uh, and the reason I think this is because Bitcoin was sitting at a slightly higher price all the way back a month ago in the beginning of December. And in the beginning of December, we were not as definite to be approved for the Bitcoin ETF next week as we are today. And uh, I mean, you can even see it in the pinned tweets here that so many people are now coming out with how certain they are from their insider information with the SEC that they're going to approve a bunch of ETFs next week. Now, personally, I am still very, very skeptical on the ETFs being approved by the SEC, but it seems like I would say 90% of the people following the situation are very, very confident that the SEC is going to approve the ETFs. So if 90% of the people are super confident that the SEC is going to approve the ETFs, why is the price of Bitcoin not pumping in the last few days leading up to the ETF? So that makes me, once again, a little skeptical that the ETFs are going to be approved. Because if there is such a certainty that the ETF were going to be approved, I think the price should be closer to fifty thousand than forty thousand. But again, that's just my opinion. Or no one really knows anything. They're pretending like they know something, and everyone is in a holding pattern, not willing to take a risk on a bullish position. Uh, I, I do agree with you, Tone, on that. Like I, I feel from how the markets have been reacting, specifically the pump, sort of like. Uh, you know, disjoint uh, nature of the market that we saw in the CME futures against the spot Bitcoin uh, price action of that 10 percent candle in the futures market, whereas uh, the Bitcoin spot price was sitting somewhere lower. It just felt as if, you know, the market people in terms of spot are sitting on their hands and thinking, you know, waiting to see what really happens. So, uh, going, I, I want to drill down a little bit more into the ETF and the ETF process and the price action associated. Now, you're saying that you expected Bitcoin to be a bit higher in terms of its price as it is right now, as we are coming closer to the ETF approval. But with so much of sound coming out that everyone, any anybody and everybody is kind of saying that next week is crucial. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it can happen in time. So what do you expect straight after that? Do you expect like a bought candle in Bitcoin or do you expect some sort of uh, volatility and then again a slowdown? Tone, you are on mute if you're trying to speak. Sorry. Okay, yeah. So let's go through the possibilities, right? So what might the SEC say 
on uh, is there a specific day or we still don't know a day? Uh, like, let's say January 10th, I think, is yeah, the date that's the been floated. Uh, yeah, so 10th of January. Is it, is it, so it's the January. Isn't there something on the 15th of January as well or no? So there's nothing on 15th of January as such, but it's more or less like 10th of January is the start of the deadline. So all of them are going to, so it, it's not like every one of them expire at the same day or they have to answer on the same day, but 10th is when it's going to start you know, flowing through and the first one is going to come on the 10th. So as per our expectations and as we have been discussing, when they're going to approve, they're going to, they're going to approve all of them so that none of them have a major competitive approach in right. the market. Okay, so yes, they are unbiased. Okay, so let, let, let's go, let's, let's say the SEC is going to come out on January 10th and make an announcement. Okay, that's going to happen. So let's make an assumption that the price of Bitcoin does not change between now and January 10th. Okay, so that's an assumption that we have to make. Price of Bitcoin remains at $43,500 or whatever it is right now as we are doing this space. And um, now the SEC could say we're approving an ETF or multiple ETFs. And uh, the SEC can say we are uh declining the etfs but uh only for only because there's just one little thing we have to do right so they can approve it and the news is positive they can decline it with positive commentary and they can decline it with negative commentary so those are the three possibilities so if the price of bitcoin remains unchanged and the SEC comes out with positive news that the SEC, that the ETFs are going to be approved, I can see a God candle. I can see the price of Bitcoin absolutely rocketing from this price. Now, if the SEC denies the ETF with positive commentary, I can see uh, an initial drop followed by uh, bullishness, but not creating a God candle, okay? If the SEC comes back with uh, negative news and negative commentary, um, I can see a big drop followed by consolidation or uh, uh, followed by consolidation, let's say that, right? So those are my views on what's going to happen if the price does not move between now and the 10th. Because there is another possibility. Another possibility that we come back on Monday. Today is already Saturday, and today is the 6th. So Monday is the 8th. We come back on Monday, and it's in the front page of Bloomberg of how confident they are that the ETF is going to get approved. And not just Bloomberg, but literally every publication known to man. And... Bitcoin starts to rally as a God candle on the 8th and the 9th of January prior to the announcement. And the price of Bitcoin is sitting at $55,000 going into January 10th. At that point, the SEC announcing positive news that they're approving the ETF is very likely to be the sell the news event if the God candle comes before the ETF is announced and because we still have four full days, okay? And Bitcoin can move eight, $9,000 in a single day. So if that God candle comes before the announcement, then there's nobody else left to buy after the announcement. Only people left to sell. And if that news, if the God candle comes and then the news is an ETF denial, whether it's positive or negative connotation to the denial, will not matter. The drop is going to be massive from 55 down to, say, 40 in the blink of an eye. OK, so there was just too many assumptions and still too much time left before January 10th to properly prepare your trade for this. But I hope that explanation made sense. 100 percent. I, I totally agree. Like I have been like we have been, as a research team uh, for Financial Summit, we have been sitting and kind of drawing the, you know, what if, what if scenarios on the CTF. And we have created our short term and long term trades based on that. What do we see and how we expect market to react? And it's the exact same thing. And 
for everyone, we haven't discussed anything. And this was four people sitting and trying to take a trade and trying to decide a trade. And Tone didn't even know about it as if like he basically said what it was to us, why he was to take you. So had hats off Tone. That's exactly what we were looking at and what we were thinking as well. So Tone, on the basis of all these things, I just put the tweet uh, in the nest. So on Friday, uh, I think Friday late, late afternoon-ish, SEC got in touch with NASA, CBOE, and they were basically asking them for a very, very uh, urgent meeting for obviously this up for the ETF itself. And they were told that you need to do everything in your power to get ready for this. This is this was this is what was coming out from uh, certain uh, outlets uh, on Twitter as well as in the news. All the forms, all the if you know, all the if parts, the, the, the dotting the i's, crossing the t's, everything was being done on Friday, and it was all over Twitter. As you said, they can reject. Obviously, they have a choice. That is one of the scenarios that can happen. But sitting at this point and looking outside the window and looking at all the things that have been going on, do you think there is a chance they're going to reject? Like, cause for me, how I'm seeing it, I'm like, you will not go through all this pain if you were to reject it. Uh, you're muted. Shit, my bad. I haven't done spaces in a while. Um, look, I, I think there is a, still a high probability is going to be rejected. The fact that the SEC is frantically scrambling and like calling these companies on the red phone that presidents have, telling them, this is super important. You need to get this paperwork done immediately. This is not a good sign, right? It means that there is still problems with the approval. And this assumption that the SEC is like, they're not able to approve the ETF because there are still certain parts of the agreements missing. And the SEC frantically screaming at these companies to immediately fix these problems is not, you know, a guarantee that these problems are going to be fixed in the 24th, 25th hour, as they call it, uh, before January 10th. So it's very possible that they're going to say, look, we frantically did all we can in order to approve the CTF. But unfortunately, there are still some gaps that need to be, you know, properly written up and checked off. And we did our best to get it done by January 10th, but we just couldn't get it done. So most likely it will get done by March, but there is still a very high probability that they're not going to get it done because if it was such a lock to get it done, they wouldn't be frantically asking for this last minute shit. Well, fair point. Welcome, Sue. Happy New Year. Oh, hey, I hope Joe. Joe heard all that. <laughs> hey, Joe, how are you? Happy New Year. I think you can hear us now. He's still on mute, though. Good morning. Happy New Year. Morning, how has Joe. This, how has this? Uh, how has twenty twenty four welcomed you? I hope it's uh, not been so. Busy. It, uh, it, it, wel it, it, it welcomed him by starvation. Go yeah, on. Joe. No, I, I I got over the gluttony and uh, you know obsessive uh, eating from uh, the end of the year and the holidays and family events and business events and everything with a nice fast, my first seventy two hour fast, which I loved. It was definitely challenging, not going to lie, but. Um, it was awesome. I feel tons of energy. It was great. Even like working out, like I felt better than when I was eating by the third day. So definitely recommend that people explore that if they haven't ever done a longer fast. Was it nothing to eat or was it like uh, water? I mean, yeah, I mean, you can have water, no, no food, no caloric intake. Okay. I'm going to try that. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> so Joe, uh, back to business. Uh, or back to our fun part. There's more fun than business, I guess. Joe, uh, we were just discussing the Bitcoin ETF. I mean, you know more than us now. We are so close yet so far. Like next three days or four days is going to be like, a, it's going to be longer than you fasting for 72 hours for sure. It's going to be a longer wait for me uh, in regards of food to beat Bitcoin ETF. What's your insight, Joe? What are you expecting in the coming week? Yeah, I think the vote is supposed to take place on Wednesday. Uh, my understanding uh, from multiple different sources, both in and out of uh, the uh, 
those in the know um, is uh, that, that we're going to get a vote and it'll, it'll get cleared. So I expect it to be approved this week. Probably you'll see the launch the following week. Um, I think it, it, everything's, anything's possible, right? That, that something gets kicked to March. I heard the end when I joined uh, of Tone's comments, but uh, if you had a gun to my head and were making me say, you know, a probability of that, I think it, the, the, the likelihood of an extension uh, to March is less than 20%. Um, so I, I, I don't really think that is something particularly high. I would, I would rate that as sort of a, uh, a strange occurrence because of what they've done to basically tell them exactly what they want with the filing, insisting on certain components, um, the objections that they've raised basically to the final paperwork are nothing. Um, they, in fact, there's some public reporting and I actually talked to, uh, one of the people at, with one of the people submitting an application that the SEC had zero comments, uh, zero feedback on the final, um, submission, which to me, like, that's basically it. It's a done deal. Uh, the fact that you're not even saying you need to fix this, you need to correct this, and they've got them all in, in time, and they created this window where, you know, the, the one thing the SEC is extremely focused on, they, they, they actually re-engineered some of their calendar to make sure it happened, is that they didn't want to give one entity a competitive advantage. They want them all to go. In other words, they don't want, like, you know, uh, some of them to get kicked for a few weeks or a month. They want all uh, 10 of them or so to launch simultaneously so as to not, not put a preference on the scale, not put a thumb on the scale in favor of one entity. Um, so, yeah, to me, I'm expecting it to launch. And then the, you know, the big story is going to be this, like there are forecasts all over the place. I, I post about this that are basically just guesses about what the flows are going to look like. And to me, that's the big story, because if you get flows that are significant above expectation, say greater than 2 billion, I think is, is the, the consensus number. You get greater than 2 billion in the first week or so of new money. And I'm not talking about like recycled money from BITO or GBTC or MSTR transitioning into the ETF. If it's new money that's not recycled from other entities, that's gonna shock Wall Street. And that could, it could engineer a snowball effect where you get more piling on, more FOMO, um, and you know, there are, there's institutional FOMO too. Uh, so like, that's the big story. If it under, if it comes in under expectations, that's obviously going to be pretty bearish, right? If you get it 500 million in inflows or 600 million, that's going to be the, the sell the news type event. Um, but the one, one other thing that I think is still a huge issue, um, that I'm also focused on before I stop is this issue with GBTC. So in the last different, uh, last ditch effort to screw GBTC, what the SEC has effectively done is they've insisted on this thing called cash creates for the shares. That is not a big deal operationally for every single applicant with the exception of GBTC. And let me explain why. So what cash creates means is that they still hold physical Bitcoin, but they have to purchase the Bitcoin with cash. In other words, they won't let individuals port Bitcoin into the, tr the into the new ETF structures similar to GBTC. Like, you know, for example, you could tender Bitcoin to, to the GBTC and then get shares, locked up shares. What they want, what the SC wants, is they want people that want shares to give cash to the ETFs uh, and then they go and buy the Bitcoin from sources that, you know, have done KYC and are, are reputable. So that's a big deal for GBTC, right? Because they're sitting on hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin that they purchased at much lower rates. And the, the likely problem is that, you know, they have to liquidate that Bitcoin, they have to sell it, and then repurchase it through an, an intermediary, which is a taxable event. So if you bought Bitcoin in the GBTC at much lower amounts, some cases they were buying Bitcoin, you know, in the uh, sub $10,000, that, that's a taxable event. And that actually can make GBTC trade at a discount to NAV even after the conversion uh, because of this tax liability that they will have to offset by pay, by selling some of their Bitcoin. So that's like a big operation. Well, wait, 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 can, we think, can we dive a little bit deeper into what you just said? Yeah. Uh, yeah. With GBTC, right? Because like, uh, if they allow GBTC to convert, this is just so weird. Like the SEC has to, uh, the SEC and Grayscale need to come up with a better land here right gbtc is trading almost at par uh yesterday it was only at a five percent discount i don't understand i mean they already have the bitcoin 
there are a KYC holder of six hundred thousand. Yeah, that's the problem, though. That, that's a that's the, the the issue for them, because if you have Bitcoin, okay, let's just walk through this. If you so what what you need to do to, to for them they would uplist right that's what it was, the technical term they'd uplist to a spot ETF from a closed end trust to uplist what the SEC has insisted on is is cash creates of shares so what does that mean it means that the entity has to buy Bitcoin with cash well to your point they already own Bitcoin they already have it so from their perspective they were pleading with the SEC. That basically to say, we would just want to use the Bitcoin we already have and then issue shares based on that. Well, they're saying, no, we don't want you to do that. You have to sell that Bitcoin and repurchase it, thereby incurring a taxable event and figuring out how to, well, how well, to have why can they, oh, oh, fucking hell. Um, but a taxable event on, on who? A taxable event on, on the trust. those the with trust. claims? No, no. I, 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 to the people who have claims no, to the Bitcoin the in the trust. No, the trust. So when you own shares, you own shares of the trust. That's just that, that you just own a portion of the trust. But the trust itself incurs tax liability. The trust in, itself has operational, you know, fees and expenses. All of that it, it has, is something that has to be taken into account. So, for example, when they pay, when they sell Bitcoin to pay fees, you all know that I think that they also have taxable events that the trust is obligated to pay. Not the shareholders, but the trust has to pay taxes on the gains of that Bitcoin. So, you know, from, from the standpoint of the SEC, if you're insisting on them using in-kind creation, or excuse me, cash creation of shares, then for them to port their Bitcoin into a new entity or into the entity itself, you have to basically liquidate the Bitcoin and then repurchase, which, that that was insisted on. That's probably a final screw you to GBTC um, for and, and Grayscale because I know the SEC is not fond of them. It makes it very operationally difficult for them to transition. I it's can't a problem. Condone. No, no, I what, was what, thinking that, that that's a problem. Yeah, I mean, listen, um, this is not being well reported, and people aren't talking about it enough, but. You know, that's the big difference with the cash creates versus in-kind. I mean, in-kind is very simple, right, Tone? So, like, here, here's how in-kind would work. If, if the SEC were not insisting on the in-kind creation of shares, uh, not insisting on cash creates, they were, if they were allowing in-kind, what they would basically do, what BlackRock could do is, Tone, you've got 2,000 Bitcoin. You can come to BlackRock. You can give me your 2,000 Bitcoin. I can then issue you shares, and there is no taxable event. Now you have shares in the BlackRock ETF from your 2000 Bitcoin equivalent, and you didn't have a taxable event at all because the Bitcoin was never sold. You had equivalent value. You created your shares with in kind. Um, that, that's a big deal for a lot of people, and a lot of people wanted that. The SEC is saying, no, we're not allowing that. We want cash creates, meaning that anybody who wants to launch an ETF, you, have to, you can buy Bitcoin. You can buy spot Bitcoin. It's not paper Bitcoin, right? It's an actual spot. But the only way we let you create shares is through you purchasing the Bitcoin with cash. So, you know, okay, well, what, what about me? I'm GBTC. I've got, you know, I've got 600,000 Bitcoin uh, or however many. I don't remember, the, know, know the exact number. Um, it I've is got 600, it's, it's around, it's around 600,000. Yeah, so I've got 600,000 Bitcoin. What do I do, SEC? Not our problem. You want to convert to an ETF? Figure out how to how to purchase Bitcoin with cash. You know, now, if you're GBTC, right, you realize that speed kills in these markets. So you have to figure out a way to launch on the same day as everybody else. And that's a big question mark. That aren't, It's a pretty hush-hush. There hasn't been a lot of public statements from, from Grayscale how they're going to actually do that. You know, there's a couple ways you could do it. Sort of maybe you sell over time based on it. Maybe you spin off a new entity and keep the, the legacy trust in place uh, and let people convert and basically give them some not one for one, but some discounted value of the new entity. We don't know any of that. You know, we, we have to figure that out. But that's but, what yeah. I would do, man. If I was GBTC, I would launch a new entity for the ETF. And be, and then I would look to arbitrage the two. Because if, you know, 
if Grayscale knows for a fact they have not been hacked and all that Bitcoin is sitting there, then again, once they're profitable, uh, if they didn't make dumb decisions like uh, with their other sub products, that was, maybe that's why Barry Silbert was kicked out. And uh, you can just, hey, anytime GBTC falls under par, bam, they buy, they buy more of their shares. And anytime, um, but they, they don't have a mechanism, right? This is the problem. It's the Hotel California problem. GBTC does not have a legal means of selling the 600,000 Bitcoin and you know, liquidating fees. that. Hmm? Other than fees. Right. So uh, they need to you know, refile. Uh, this is what I would consider. I would consider refiling GBTC with the ability to sell Bitcoin out of the trust and then their own uh, new entity for their ETF can buy them from the trust as the trust slowly gets liquidated. Yeah, there is another possibility that we haven't really talked about. There is uh, potential for um, exemptions that the SEC could do if they were being nice to Grayscale. They could exempt uh, the conversion and say, yes, we want cash creates except for legacy products. It's that would be a smart thing to do, but like you said, the SEC seems to really, really hate uh, yeah. Grayscale. So we'll find that out. I mean, once we get the votes and the approval next week, we'll, we'll know that. And that's going to be a big issue. So that's what I'm watching very closely. I don't think market participants um, are focused enough on it. Like, you know, you got a huge pot of Bitcoin, right? 600,000. Um, what is going to happen with that? And what kind of market disrupt? I mean, it's going to be market, massive market disruption, in my opinion, if Grayscale does not launch on day one, because you're going to have panic among people. And I do believe that, that they can't, you know, they can't get access to the real spot Bitcoin. Uh, hey, Joe, before we get Simon in here, let me let me just uh, Simon, before you jump in, uh, Simon had some thoughts on the whole tax thing. Uh, let me just throw a couple of more questions at Joe. So one of them is, let's assume the best, right? Let's assume, I, by the way, I still think at 60%, the SEC is going to find a way to the latest till March, right? I'm 60-40 on this one. 60 that they're going to delay and 40% that they, they, they're going to approve. Let's assume they approve. Uh, when do you think uh, will be the first day somebody can trade one of these stickers. And by the way, I'm pretty sure the most incompetent one is going to be the first one available for trading. But let's say they approve 10 of them, right? Um, what, what do you think is a realistic first day someone can log into Interactive Brokers and buy one of these things? Probably the 17th. I'm sorry, what? The what? I, I didn't hear that. Probably the 17th. Of January? Yes. Wow, that quickly, huh? Jeez, okay. Yeah, the, the the reason is is because there's there's so so technically you know it takes time operationally to get it ready, but they know in this market. I mean, first of all, let's start from the premise that I I put a strong bet that a year to two years from now, somewhere in that range, uh, there will not be as many spot ETFs on the market. You're not going to see this this many. It happens in every single time. There's a there's a new product launch. You see a flurry of products come to market and most ETFs, they don't survive because they just don't get the flows and then they go away. Um, this is why there aren't, you know, 12 gold ETFs, right? People have tried, people have launched other alternatives to the GLD. There are some other alternatives, but, you know, there's the market sort of concentrates. So, um, you know, you'll see a pairing of these folks that it'll, it'll be paired back. Uh, to uh, a small number of them that have sufficient market cap and liquidity, et cetera, and that are the preferred uh, preferred vehicles. Um, so I think w the reason why I bring that up is because, again, speed kills, right? You're going to see huge inflows on day one, day two, and then, you know, the inflows will probably teeter off. And then depending on where Bitcoin's price action is, if it keeps going higher through the end of the year, we could see them reaccelerate. But you know, look at the, for example, look at the Ethereum futures ETF, look at the Bitcoin futures ETF. You saw a, first sur a surge in the first 48 hours of trading, then they kind of teetered away. And then they actually had very good flows uh, in the early part of this year, um, the futures ETFs. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's that's typical of sort of the life cycle of the ETFs. They co go and uh, come and go with the, the, the bull market. 
Um, so, you know, the reason I say that is because if, like, if you're, you're a market participant, you have an incentive to launch immediately. That's why they're doing some of the, some of them are running Super Bowl ads and et cetera. They're really trying to get out ahead of their competitors. And you're going to see some, you know, distinctions at the margins like fees. And I, I expect some of them to uh, actually list um, and provide publicly the, the coins they have. Uh, once they, they're up and running to the public, while well, others will not do that for uh, security and um, front running reasons. So you're going to see some distinction in the marketplace trying to give different entities competitive advantage. Um, Galaxy's trying some stuff. But the, the point yeah, is, I think one, make... of them, one of them also uh, promised that they will invest uh, X amount in Bitcoin infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, Venac, right. Venac. Yeah, Venac, Venac yes. So, the, the, the point the point is that like I mean like they're fighting each other right they're fighting each other for the initial uh, share and speed kill so how does that relate to Tone's question Tone's question is when are they, they going to launch well technically uh, you can launch I think within forty eight hours of the approval um, so you know operationally I think they're going to want seven days or so so if they get, if we get the vote on Wednesday per se um, you know or, or Tuesday uh, you, I would expect trading at least uh, the next week and it will be hey, all Joe? of them. Hey, Joe, real quick. So it's so just that before we get Simon in here. So in, in my opinion, right, and if anyone from Grayscale is listening, I would not convert the Grayscale ET, uh, uh, you know, ETN, which I'm assuming it is, into an ETF. And instead, I would do what they should have done years ago, drop the management fee from 2% to like half a percent. Or whatever these ETFs are doing, Grayscale should be more efficient at managing that Bitcoin than these new people to the market are because they have the most experience of dealing with Bitcoin. If I was them, I would immediately drop that management fee below their competitors in order to keep people trading GBTC. And every time GBTC, and then also set up a structure where they can sell the underlying Bitcoin. And then whenever GBTC enters a premium, not discount, premium, which it potentially will, if it's a better ticker for people to hold because it's cheaper with a smaller management fee, the moment that thing goes into a premium, they would then start liquidating that underlying Bitcoin into their other ticker, which is an ETF. Uh, that could be a potential solution. I'm just like brainstorming here, but I didn't realize these kinds of tax implications. Um, I think on this note, we should bring Simon in, unless Joe, you want to comment on what I just said? No, I'm good. Okay, Simon, jump in here. And I do see Terrence and Zach asking to be speakers. Uh, we'll we'll get you guys in in a little bit. Uh, I mean, like we really like just like keeping the space with. Uh, so that pe too many people don't talk over each other, and we want to give people, you know, proper time to get their thoughts in. Hey, Tone. Hey, Joe. Happy New Year. Um, yeah, the, the the tax side of this, because essentially, uh, Grayscale is engaging in a restructuring, um, and we got lots of experience in this from all the crypto bankruptcies. Um, and so, like, the, the normal way you would manage something like this efficiently within like a intercompany structure where you're going from one entity to another um, would be through loans but when loans are done specifically for the purpose of tax efficiency um, obviously this is a multi-billion dollar paycheck for the IRS so the IRS would just scrutinize everything um, but we, we had this exact um, issue in the in the crypto lending restructuring uh, because essentially what, what was ruled in court was that when you deposited with BlockFi um, or Celsius or any of those companies, um, it created a taxable event upon deposit because the court ruled that the property belongs to the estate. So in the case of Grayscale, um, the, whether the Bitcoin by terms and conditions and by case study and court ruling and some of the crypto uh, chapter 11 bankruptcies could come in by case law. Um, I'm not quite sure of the actual ownership. Maybe Joe knows the ownership structure of the Bitcoin, because I think you own shares and then maybe, um, you know, I think the, the, the yeah, it would be, it would be a taxable event for, again, not tax advice, just to put that out there. 
um, but a taxable event for the entity if the entity owns the Bitcoin. Um, with the with the Chapter 11 bankruptcies, you were lending your Bitcoin to the platform and then they could do things with it. Um, but it, the, the loan got taken out uh, because the court ruled that it was actually property of the estate and then the estate could actually use it, sell it. Um, and so everyone that deposited in one of these bankruptcies uh, created a taxable event for themselves and it was a taxable event. Uh, for the underlying entity. So when you put an entity in the middle of Bitcoin, uh, you just create all these issues. But yeah, you could imagine creating a structure whereby units are issued in the ETF over time and then you borrow the Bitcoin uh, from the previous entity. Uh, but the complexity of it would make it really uncompetitive because trying to disclose that in a in a transparent way in an S1 filing or something like that would just be so complex and uncompetitive relative to uh, the other offerings and stuff. But yeah, the tax in all of these restructurings and all of these M&A deals, whenever you're doing that, like you always end up with tax being the actual thing that gets in the way of uh, doing the things exactly how you want to do it. Yeah, just to add one thing, Simon, I, I agree with everything you said. Um, the, the one thing I will just point out is that the SEC didn't have to do this, right? So let's assume that they're law. I know, Tony, you have doubts still, but let's assume they're approving the, the creation of the ETF. There is, in my view, no real reason, no legitimate reason they couldn't allow in kind. In kind is very common. Uh, GLD uses in kind, for example. Um, you know, other commodities ETFs use in kind. Uh, it's not uh, not unusual now. If you ask them, and I think they had, they would give you a pretextual reason why, like some made up reason why they'll say something about they have concerns about AML, uh, money laundering, et cetera. But keep in mind, like, you know, I'm sure Grayscale did diligence on the coins they acquired for that trust. I'm sure those aren't d dirty coins. Um, they probably had safeguards in place and were watching it very carefully. I don't think they just uh, acquired a bunch of, you know, uh, dirty coins. Um, so I don't really find that to be a legitimate reason for them not to allow uh, and they could have easily required like, okay, you can do in kind, but it has to have, you know, standard KYC AML, um, uh, you know, uh, input in terms of, you know, allowing creation of shares. So to me, like, I think it is just an overt effort to say, screw you, Grayscale. We don't want you to have, we want you to have more challenges than other applicants because you were uh, playing fast and loose in the creation of the GBTC and you sued us and caused this whole problem to begin with. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's a good point at the end there. And, uh, and even and if... It's a massive <laughs> the, but literally, if you want to know the, the actions of the IRS, the, the IRS came in with a $45 billion claim ahead of FTX creditors to steal client money ahead of the actual people whose money it was. Um, so it's a, big, it's a big paycheck, this restructuring. Yeah, no, no, that, that is true. And uh, also Joe's other point, if Grayscale did take in, you know, shady Bitcoins to back the trust, by them taking it, they have cleaned it, right? So they would have to sell it to an exchange, making it clean by default because they're buying it from Grayscale. So it's not that this money, it, it, it's automatically now clean. Like, like if they had taken some questionable money, this they, they laundered it. Like, like that's it. Like, it's not going to get frozen again. It's clean by default because it's been mixed with their all, all their other coins. Like, this is why it makes no sense. Uh, can Grayscale go into a deal with a big exchange like Kraken or Coinbase where they would send, like, you know, their big pool, but it's still a taxable event. Damn, that doesn't solve them of the problem. Uh, yeah, exactly. that's a, that's, doesn't matter. that's a bit of an I issue. Mean, yeah, I mean, look, liquidity is one issue. Like, I mean, there, there are a few entities that can just quickly absorb 600,000 Bitcoin. Um, you know, just goes, <laughs> go look what would happen if you dumped uh, in a short period of time 600,000 Bitcoin on Coinbase. Liquidity would dry up very quickly and you'd be back in probably the 20K range on Bitcoin. Um, but uh, that's just my supposition there. But putting it aside, like, the, the, that's not uh, really the issue. It's, it's, it's the opposite, right? You're flooding liquidity in and there's not enough to absorb it. So, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh... That's right. I, Correct. That's what I mean. But the, the point is, the point is, like, 
that's only one part of the problem. The problem to me isn't that, but whether there's sufficient buy side you know, support. <laughs> to me, the bigger problem is like the taxable event because you have to pay your taxes with your assets, right? They, it's not like the, the trust has other income. Other, the fees themselves uh, you know, are, are extracted from the trust. It's from them selling their assets. And tax, taxes are also extracted from them selling their assets. Yeah, no, even, uh, even though it's not quite connected as well, but I, I can't help but think they're treating Digital Currency Group as a group um, and thinking that, remember, all the Gemini uh, Bitcoin um, and the Genesis Bitcoin, sorry, um, was part of the two-way trades on top of the whole 3AC debacle, uh, which was where everything was being borrowed for FTX, Celsius, uh, from retail, so it goes all the way down the chain um, as well. So you, I don't yeah. think they're going to forget about. I don't think they're going to be thinking about these things independently. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. I, I do have to jump here, but it's great talking to you, everybody. Um, I'll talk to you again soon. Hope we have another show in uh, the coming weeks. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. We got to bring this back uh, and uh, do a, a YouTube show about this on the Financial Summit channel as well. Uh, coming up. Hey, thanks for joining us, Joe. Uh, keep you posted on any on any others. We might bring, you know, Terrence in here. He has some uh, trading experience and law experience. And I'm going to throw out here that, man, with this confusion, uh, with SEC really screwing GBTC and uh, being kind of torn, if, if let's say 10 e or like four ETFs launch on uh, January 17th, as Joe is anticipating, uh, and they may not even be the most, uh, the best ones. Like it depends. Like BlackRock will be one of the better ones, and Ben Ike knows what they're doing, and uh, a few other professional ETF companies uh, know what they're doing. Uh, instead of like, like trying to juggle between them all, uh, it might be a prove. And, and for those that want exposure to Bitcoin, something like MicroStrategy or you know, the Bitcoin mining ETF might be like a more stable, safer choice until the system works itself out. What do you think, Simon? Well, I think the, the initial wave is all going to be the R RIAs telling everyone to buy Bitcoin every month. So I think I think the initial wave is going to be all retail um, again. And so bring in a bunch of new people. But Bitcoin, um, I'm sorry, Simon, but buying Bitcoin how? In what form, right? Like... Uh, we're already we're already dealing with a retail investor on a brokerage account. So buying self custodied Bitcoin is not no, what no, we're the, talking sorry, about. The ETF. So the, who, who's going to buy the ETF initially? Well, the institutions they're in no rush. They're going to wait. They're going to wait for the liquidity, and so they're going to wait to figure out which ETF has got all the liquidity, which is their primary, right, right. primary but, decision. But the, average, but the average consumer is not that sophisticated. They're going to rush in. So, yeah. uh, like, I don't know which ETF to rush in into, right? Like, I don't know. Like, once the SEC puts out an approval list, uh, those companies will then have to announce on which day their ticker is going to start trading. And I never trade a company on its IPO day, not Google, not Facebook, none of those. Uh, why would I trade an ETF on its launch day? Uh, but if the ETF do does do what it's supposed to do and start buying up Bitcoin in cash from exchanges, it's going to raise the price of Bitcoin. But I don't want to pick and choose which ETF is going to be the winner and which one is going to completely fuck up. So that's, and if Grayscale is having this issue, maybe the best solution is a different Bitcoin proxy, like a MicroStrategy or a Bitcoin mining index, if you don't want to pick and choose miners. I have my favorite miners. Everyone knows what my two favorite miners are. They're BitFarms and CleanSpark. But again, it's kind of risky to choose a single miner or even split your shares between them. Like, is... Uh, are Bitcoin mining companies and like MicroStrategy, which is basically a Bitcoin proxy, a better way to take advantage of potential rise in the underlying price of Bitcoin because of ETFs launching is my uh, comment slash question. Yeah, so um, I think you've got to look at, at the different pockets of money and who's looking to get exposure now. So if you think about the different pockets of money, right, you've got 
you got the Bitcoiners that just buy DCA every single month. They're going to be self-custody people. The only reason that they would do it through their ETF is if they've got retirement funds that need something tax efficient um, with their, uh, you know, TradFi pension um, or something like that. Yes, you got the exactly. De- you got the DGENs. The DGENs are just going to be going whenever the 1000X is. They'll stay in crypto. They're not going to do anything here. Uh, but then you've got the, the, I think the people that are going to be trading, like your, I think, Tone, like you, you actually trade through your, um, you know, your, uh, your, your pension structure and stuff. So I trade in my, I trade in my raw fire array. So all my profits yeah. are tax free. And I've been, uh, I've been in, I'm in GBTC uh, pretty heavily. And I've been enjoying this discount going all the way back to 5% from negative 50%. And now, and over the next, uh, like, over the next seven days, I need to decide where I want that money to go. Like, should I put it into Bitcoin miners? Now that I've squeezed out the majority of uh, the advantage of being in at such a low uh, GBTC uh, discount, now it's time to move this money. But I don't want to pick and choose an, an ETF like an IPO. Uh, I may just put this money into Bitcoin miners and, and MicroStrategy. I might just go one third into MicroStrategy, one third into BitFarms, and one third into uh, CleanSpark. This is not trading advice, and I haven't done this. Uh, I may or may not do this, uh, but this sounds like a potential way to ride this level of uncertainty for the first few months of ETFs launching. Yeah, so I think I think a lot of people will have the same thought. So those that are more sophisticated through TradFi um, will already know how to do it. So they'll they'll have their proxies, like their micro strategies, as you said. Um, there's also the blockchain ETFs, which um, you know the Van Eyck ones and the BlackRock ones, which invest in a a boss. Right, Val- 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 All those, yeah, Valkyrie. Um, so the, the question is, who's going who's gonna to provide the initial liquidity for the new Bitcoin ETFs? And I think, I think the speculators of the ETFs are going to be all the registered investors. Back up. When you say who's going to provide the initial liquidity for the ETF, uh, that question can be taken in two different ways. The liquidity of the retail investor buying the ticker or the liquidity for the underlying Bitcoin that the ETF is going to have to purchase on the open market. Which one are we talking about specifically? Exactly. So the liquidity for the people buying the ticker um, and in terms of where the liquidity for the people um, buying the underlying is just going to be our normal Coinbase and, and our normal liquidity now. But the people that are going to buy the ticker is going to be the registered investment advisor that pitches their client saying, rather than doing a, you know, a stock bond 60-40, let's do an allocation of 5% to the Bitcoin ETF. And it's going to be retail. Right, but, 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 they have no, but, but, but like, if I am clueless as to which Bitcoin ETF uh, a person should buy, how the hell is a traditional investment advisor going to properly advise their clients on which ETF to buy. Well, then then goes into your trust in the TradFi financial system, because obviously a registered investment advisor has a fiduciary duty to provide what is in the best interest of their client, and a broker um, just goes wherever the commission is. And so the registered investment advisors are probably going to go with their relationships, um, but they've also got a fiduciary duty to ensure that it's the best product. So that's going to be a bit of a, a transition phase. Uh, and then once all that liquidity is in, it's going to become apparent there'll probably be some mergers or someone recognizing they're a loser and merging into the other one and going through the whole Barry Silbert restructuring thing to merge these different ETFs. And eventually the institutions will be in there once they know where all the high volume is, where they can get in and out and they can rebalance their portfolios at scale. It's going to take right. some time. So- Right. So let's also explain because, we, we, wow, th- thank you so much, guys, for listening to this. We are over, uh, we're probably close to 700 listeners right now, which is uh, close to a record uh, here on the Financial Summit Twitter space. 
So let's explain to the retail investors, right, what happens when there are 10 uh, different Bitcoin ETFs on the market. Uh, right now, we have this with the gold, maybe not 10. We definitely have it with S&P. Some of them are going to be more liquid than others. And what does that mean? That means that the spread, the buy and the sell spread is going to be tighter on the most liquid and most traded ETF. So for example, let's assume that these ETFs are going to launch at you know 100x uh, uh, or let's say 1,000x lower, right? So in uh, Bitcoin is 43,000. These ETFs are going to start trading at $43 to mimic the price of Bitcoin. I think that's reasonable, right, Simon? Uh, yeah, that's what you'd expect. Right. So let's expect all of these, let's say five Bitcoin ETFs launch on January 17th as Joe is you know, speculating. And some of them are going to instantly be a lot more liquid. The BlackRock one is probably more trusted. And this is where companies like BlackRock are now you know, lobbying different financial advisors to promote their ETF to their clients. So if the BlackRock ETF starts getting most people buying the ticker that they launched versus, say, a Van Eyck ticker, then that ticker starts trading more actively, and the buy as spread is going to be very, very tight. Let's say ten cents uh, between the buy and uh, between the bid and the ask. Whoever of the five ETFs launching uh, that day gets the short end of the stick. The spread on that ETF could be a dollar between $42 and $43 instead of, you know, $43.05 uh, and uh, $42.95. And, and hence, clear winners are going to come out. Now, a lot of this is also going to depend on what their uh, commission ratio on that ETF is going to be that will determine some of this and their reputation and their ability to advertise. So, Again, nobody knows which of these ETFs is going to draw the initial retail ETF that is cost oh, like several percent on you know buying it in and out because it does not have the retail liquidity. So this is something for people to keep in mind, and these spaces are generally just educating uh, those that are listening. Um, but the big question is that everyone really wants to know is. What does this mean for the underlying price of Bitcoin? What kind of flood of cash are we looking at uh, of bait transfers and Van Eyck and well, all the other thing I want exchanges? To... Yeah, go, go, go. One more thing I wanted to add also, yeah. Tone, the same, the same question, uh, my, my question is really the same. Could we expect a similar price action in regards of what we saw with the gold ETF in 2004? Like, the anticipation, little bit of up movement, then then a good consolidation, and then the real pump or the real uh, volatility in terms of price action came in. Yeah, the bit the bit that I like about this launch. I, I honestly, I, 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 I can't hear Simon. I don't know. If, are you saying so? Uh, can you try again, Simon? I was going to say yeah, something as well. Now? I still don't hear Simon. But, uh, Is it just me? I'll go down and come back up. No, I can do it. Simon, go on. Can you hear Simon? Oh, go on, John. Yeah, I could hear. Him. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me go on, and then I may have to. Dro oh, Simon dropped off. I think oh, I dropped yeah, off. Yeah, he's correct. Okay. So, yeah. uh, or oh, maybe I should wait for Simon. Oh, uh, maybe I should wait for Simon to come back. Um. So, so one question is. Hey, you mind muting? Uh. Uh. Okay. Um, okay, Simon's coming back. Well, let's get Simon back in here. So one question I just raised is, what are the anticipated cash flows from the ETF providers to the exchanges to buy a Bitcoin? But the bigger question is, have these ETF providers already acquired a shit ton of Bitcoin or are in futures contracts from OTC to acquire this Bitcoin? And this big run-up that we have witnessed over the last six months is already the effect of these uh, exchange uh, launching, ETF launching institutions.
have already purchased the Bitcoin. So there's going to be a much lower flood of additional buys uh, from Coinbase's and Krakens of the world to fund the Bitcoin for these ETFs. Uh, let's get uh, Simon back in here. So those are uh, the questions that no one really knows the answer to, but we can speculate on them um, all we like. Uh, but I think that is something super important uh, to consider as well. I can't see him yet in the listeners, so maybe he's trying to join in. Uh, till then, we can get uh, and uh, let him ask uh, his question. Can you hear me, Tan? Yeah. Okay, cool. I can. Yes, I can. Yes. Okay. Uh, really good questions, and yeah, the answer's right. Nobody, nobody knows apart from the prime broker and the exchange is actually facilitating the transaction. So I'm sure Coinbase knows or Van Eyck know. They they know. Um, I haven't actually read through all the filings, and not sure if that was actually disclosed. Um, but typically, you would normally disclose whether you're underwriting or not. And I'm not sure. I don't know enough about them all. I didn't go into each one individually to know whether they've underwritten some Bitcoin, whether they bought a bunch of Bitcoin already. Um, my guess is that they've just been book building. Um, I think, uh, you know, there were rumors out there that BlackRock saying that they've got about $2 billion of pre-orders, whether that's true or not, we don't know. Um, and then they've got to buy them. But yeah, whether they've actually already got a bunch of Bitcoin that they've underwritten and that they're willing to sell. Uh, I, don't, I don't think anyone knows. But what I really do like is the way the SEC did it. Um, rather than picking a winner, saying BlackRock, you get the whole market, first mover advantage. Um, I think they did it in the right way, which is just get a bunch of people together, coordinate the launch, and uh, just really let the free market rip. And now everyone's competing with all their different offerings. Like, I don't know if you covered it earlier, but Van Eyck wants to contribute, I think, half a percent of the fees to Bitcoin core development. That creates its own interesting controversy around having access control and direction around funding core developers um, and all sorts of interesting things. So everyone's going to come up with their own competitive way of incentivizing people. Um, so you should really look at all the different offerings. I'm sure someone's uh, going to create sites around the comparisons and all the different structures. Um, but I think it's going to be a really interesting launch. I don't. I don't think it's going to be, in terms of like price action, if I were to guess, um, I personally believe, uh, I don't know, they've they got surveys out there where I think, I think those that are really close to Bitcoin have reached like a 90%, 99% almost probability that this is being approved. But there's a lot of surveys out there saying that a lot of the TradFi people um, some of the surveys were saying that only 35% of them believe that there will be a Bitcoin ETF in 2024, implying that they may not have been following it as closely as we have. Um, so there may be some additional thing. Maybe maybe there's a spike on the news and then it's a sell, sell the news event shortly after. But fundamentally, over the next year, I think there's going to be significant increases in volume. Um, I don't know what the trade's like. I'll leave that to Tony to, to, to look at the trade. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so real, real quick, I want to uh, come on. I also see, um, I see a comment from uh, Mike Connors over uh, when you go to the, the bottom right, where he says, uh, Mike, your comment is no, you can't front run an ETF, period. I fundamentally disagree with that statement. Everyone has already been front running the Bitcoin ETF based on how much the price of Bitcoin has gone up. And this entire move has literally been kicked off from a fake tweet by Cointelegraph. In hindsight, that tweet turned out to be somewhat correct uh, when they tweeted that the Bitcoin ETF is imminent. Now, they tweeted this, let's say, three months ago, right? But even on that news, I said, hey, you know, that fake tweet had literally showed everyone that they are underweight Bitcoin in anticipation of the ETF. Everyone witnessed it with their eyes. So I fundamentally have to disagree with that statement because everyone has been already uh, front running the ETF by buying into Bitcoin and they have performed very, very well. The question now is, with only three or four days to go before the announcement, 
is it time to you know to sell the news when it happens as simon just mentioned uh or is there more upside to go in this front running the etf and i see mike dropped off because he clearly was not a fan of my statement uh we do have uh simon and uh terence and our host of the financial summit is a cmt and what do you guys think of my statement and should might have Mike have completely dropped should Mike have dropped out of this space by me disagreeing with him <laughs> I, i i would just i would just say that uh, we were there on this conversation don when this whole tweet came out and at that moment also we discussed that we do not think that bitcoin's price has all digested the etf news we are sitting at 43k 44k to be honest and honestly i am scared where we are going to see this price by the end of the year because my realistic approach you know views in the beginning were 120 100k you know post having but i'm scared i think it's going to be much higher than what i target yeah i'd say um maybe the front running rules apply to the individual company that is structuring the etf um but it feels like a bit of an ignorant view the for example you know if you were involved in issuing the gld etf the the company or some company within the group didn't already have a massive gold position um so front running it's not quite like a you know an ipo where you you're the investment bank running the ipo and then you you find out how to buy some private equity in the pre, or the pre ipo market uh when you're dealing with a commodity uh, you know a commodity backed etf where pretty much everyone could have bought bitcoin and have the commodity over the last is that really front running maybe the front running only applies to buying units in the etf um because buying bitcoin and buying a unit in an etf is a different financial product so i'm not quite sure if the front running rules apply maybe someone knows better uh but it doesn't sound right to me Right, because like you said it's a commodity yeah oh one one last thing for uh, Terence and then you can jump in um i think the constant comparison of the bitcoin etf comparing it to the gld gold etf um i, I don't i i think people are over uh correlating the relationship um yes the uh you know gold went up a lot alongside the gold etf launching but that doesn't mean that it directly correlates right there were other factors involved first off gold was on like a 26 year bear market when that etf eventually launched second the technology finally allowed for the gold etf to launch like like the price of gold could have gone up to the same levels with or without the etf like people are um like over i i believe people are a little overstating the cause and effect relationship here and constant comparisons of the bitcoin etf to the gold etf um i think it's uh i i mean look i'm i'm not saying it's wrong i'm just saying it's overblown no that's true very well said yeah i think um i think the comparison is useful obviously there's market dynamics but making it easier to own an asset i mean you know being able to own gold through a really easy mechanism in your retirement account is a significant improvement for those that are looking for ease of use not you know we all know that gold in custody is better but uh gold gold self custody is is dangerous hard um and it doesn't really scale unless you're a, you know you're you use a third party custodian so the the comparison i think is useful because the etf did make it a lot easier and i imagine there are a bunch of people that have been intimidated by self custody they're going to find a custody solution um easier but remember gold already had 5000 years of gold accumulation before it <laughs> um so you know that that's a a slight a slight different here we've only had 12 well 14 years of bitcoin accumulation and probably only like 3 or 4 years for those um that uh, are interested in this product the other thing is yep. that gold had already oh. kind of established itself as a as a store of value and a preserver of wealth whereas bitcoin is kind of seen as an increaser of wealth because it's a speculative store of value where a bunch of people still don't believe whether it's going to be a store of value so you'd expect it to be 
a bigger effect than a store of value, you know, tracking a, a product that's already established itself as a preserver of wealth. Um, and the interesting thing comes in that whole thing that Joe was talking about in the beginning, which is the cash versus in kinds. Because if this becomes a mechanism for getting into Bitcoin and then being, being discovering the benefits of self-custody, which will still be a niche relative to custody, um, and then you can pull it out in, in kind without a taxable event and go to a cold wallet. Um, that's going to be really, really interesting because that will be an alternative to an exchange. Um, hey, real, real, real quick, I want to. I, I, I brought Mark up as a speaker as well. Uh, but Terence, we promised you that you you haven't had a say yet. So <laughs> sure. we're gonna go with Terence first, and then we'll uh, then we'll have the convo with uh, Mark over pre running the ETF. Thanks for having me. So um, to build on what Simon said. Bitcoin is going to be hugely legitimized by some of the biggest and best players uh, in finance. So whether it's uh, BlackRock, Fidelity, Invesco, but also JP Morgan, Jane Street, Goldman Sachs, they're all involved in these ETFs, the last three as authorized participants or market makers for these ETFs. So that's going to cause a lot of rich and powerful people in the U.S. to take a fresh look or new look, a second look, whatever, at Bitcoin. And a lot of them are going to buy the Bitcoin ETF. A lot of them are also going to figure out it's much better to self-custody Bitcoin and have the real thing. Yeah, I think what I can't, what I can't wait to see is rather than someone getting into Bitcoin by watching a Tone Vey, Simon Dixon, or Andreas Antonopoulos video, there's going to be real professional prospectuses explaining like the, the four-year cycle um, and, you know, all of the, the, the nuances of the technology and stuff. It's going to, it's going to become really a professional pitch. Um, but, they will have to, they, but they will have to go to Tone Vey's YouTube channel to learn about all those things first. That's true. <laughs> So it's going to be, it's going to be fun. Yeah. The other thing I'd add is, um, I don't know if you guys touched on this earlier. I joined a bit late. The unit bias that Wall Street is fixing with their ETFs, where you can buy for 25 bucks a share, one of these BlackRock ETFs, that makes it much easier for uh, retail and other investors to limp in, so to speak, and get some exposure to Bitcoin. Yeah, that's another good point, actually, because I haven't read all of these perspectives, right? It's uh, like, yes, they are backed by the real Bitcoin, right? But the SEC could allow them to back the the ETF with one twenty thousandth fraction of a Bitcoin, right? So, like, like it's not like it's being backed. Uh, the the or. I mean, maybe it's being backed dollar invested, dollar into Bitcoin, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be fractionalized, right? So what is that fraction? Yeah, that, that's a really big one. Like, I mean, for how long, Tone, have we been over a decade, people have been asking, do I need to have uh, $40,000? Do I need to buy one Bitcoin? Uh, and finally, the answer to that in the ETF will be answered, yeah. Um, and you're trying right. to explain a fraction of a Bitcoin, but now you can just buy a whole share. Right. But but that share, again, that share could launch at $40. It can launch at $400 or it can launch at four cents. Right. So if they launch a Bitcoin ETF uh, equivalent to four cents, like, hey, we're going to start it off really low. We're expecting it to go to a thousand bucks, but we're going to start it off at four cents. So now every share that someone buys uh, you know, at four cents. I mean, it's just uh, what fraction of that goes into Bitcoin? Uh, I need to read the prospectus and I have not done that yet. All right, let, let's, uh, uh, Mark, uh, jump into the conversation. I don't hear Mark. Crap. Um, uh, nor do I. Either nor do I. I'll have to jump off and come back or Mark has to no, jump no, off no, and come John, back. No, 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 I can't hear him as well. Can you hear me? Mark, Mark needs to drop down and come back. Yeah, Mark, can I'll you reach out in the space, please? Well, uh, um, any other, we have like, 
There's like 34 comments to the space. Any uh, anything a lot good? Of them. Uh, can you take a, a look? I, I like a them. lot of them. A lot of them. I I like one of them, which I wanted to ask you guys. Uh, it's from Dr. Said Heather. Uh, has like this, this? You were just about. You were talking about this stone just now. That has anyone examined uh, the filings? Does BlackRock buy one to one Bitcoin as the only underlying asset backing the ETF share, or is the ETF more synthetic, like having you know long and short uh, positions in there? And it's not hundred percent back. So, is there any idea about how it is backed as of now? Do we have any clarity on that? Yeah, no. An ETF is not meant to take any speculative value, so it's just um, it's just Bitcoin is my understanding. Uh, I haven't read the prospectus. I do have to admit, but yeah, once you start doing things and adding risk, then you're now a mutual fund rather than an ETF. Makes sense. Well, the rest of them, Tone. I'm going through them. I don't. Find uh, I, got, I got one more interesting topic. I think is um, Tom might want to comment on is rebalancing. So imagine you've got your trad five portfolio, your bonds are giving you five percent, your stocks are giving you twenty percent, uh, and Bitcoin's giving you one hundred and fifteen percent. Then you're trying to keep to a Bitcoin allocation of no more than one percent or five percent. So at the end of every rebalancing cycle, um, you're going to have to sell a bunch of Bitcoin because Bitcoin keeps outperforming or you're going to end up like starting to compete where pension funds start to compete with hedge funds in terms of the types of returns they're generating. It's going to be really interesting if the cycle continues. Yeah, this has really laid the groundwork for pension funds, endowments, um, governments, and so forth to get ready to start buying Bitcoin. A lot of these Fortune 500 companies, for example, they're going to take their time, but they're going to—it's going to speed up a bit as um, they see everybody else who's, you know, usually much earlier than them get into Bitcoin and Bitcoin ETFs. So this is laying the groundwork for a huge amount of cash uh, that will come into Bitcoin in future years. Totally, 100%. But people do not realize it's not just about Bitcoin. It's about the products that these companies will end up creating on top of these ETFs. Like, this is, it's a Pandora's box, right? Like, whenever you're trading any asset or any asset is introduced, you're not just trading that specific instrument that was created you basically can create so many synthetic instruments out of those instruments which will end up being traded so i'm looking forward to how these not just from the trading perspective but also from the wealth management perspective from the asset management perspective of these ibs how do they play this whole market now because now they have a full run on it like i have been seeing such a big number of vacancies opening up in, in the top three top four banks in the world at this point of time for crypto traders, crypto analysts, crypto researchers. And I'm like, OK, this is not going to stop at just Bitcoin. So can I ask you one question, Simon? We have been talking about Bitcoin ETF, this whole space. I know Tone doesn't like a lot of other uh, <laughs> crypto coins, but Ethereum spot ETF has also been discussed. And we have some deadlines on that as well, which are coming through. So do you think a Bitcoin spot ETF approval will give a green light to an Ethereum spot ETF approval, which indeed is a company and which indeed has a revenue. And how do you think that's going to play out? Because once Bitcoin is approved, I don't see any reason for them saying Ethereum cannot be cannot have a spot ETF. Yeah, so uh, let me take your first point in terms of once we've got a Bitcoin ETF, what financial products? And then I'll take the other point as well. Um, so obviously this opens up Pandora's box. You'll probably get Bitcoin ETF options, uh, Bitcoin ETF back loans, Bitcoin ETF yield will come back. Um, so people will be buying people's Bitcoin ETF in order, sorry, borrowing it in order to go short. Um, so you're going to have yield on Bitcoin, which would be a way of TradFi trying to incentivize people uh, to go a little bit higher risk and they'll just recreate, you know, what, what happened in our market, but without all the fraud and full transparency of a public reporting company. Um, and then obviously all the TradFi fraud and manipulation that comes from that um, that we see in the TradFi space as well. 
In terms of next, yeah, uh, I do think you'll get an, an Ethereum ETF. The reason being is because once it transitioned to proof of stake, you had the ability for whoever owns the largest stake to own the network. So at the moment, obviously, the exchanges own most of the, the stake of Ethereum and the pre um, you know, founders coins. Um, but if, uh, in the end, the banks want to own a public blockchain with traction, uh, then the ETF will be a really good mechanism for owning a massive chunk of the stake. And then I think a lot of the other players will come in and all the banks will want to own a chunk of the stake uh, and they'll just create a TradFi network for um, pushing whether they can get their pub, depending on whether they go all private blockchain or public blockchain, then the public blockchain products could be used and the banks would, and the, the ETFs will just become a network for owning um, Ethereum and controlling it almost like a, a quasi central bank structure, but rather than debt and yield is based upon transaction fees and staking. I think a lot of banks are going to want to own Ethereum. And so that was one of the risks that they took when they pivoted from proof of work to proof of stake. Um, and I think uh, the ETF I'm actually, so. I'm actually going to push back on this a little bit, right? Um, I honestly think that every single person that works at the SEC uh, and the government, they're completely clueless on the difference between proof of work and proof of stake. Like Gary Gensler understands that there's Bitcoin and there's shit coins. But uh, what you laid out, Simon, is very, very logical that by them going proof of stake, they have grossly centralized their system to the point where those statements that Ethereum has become sufficiently decentralized and it's now, you know, this decentralized thing, it has completely reversed through proof of stake is just. People that don't understand the theory don't understand it yet. And there hasn't been an incident in practice to prove it, but it's coming. So while it's logical to say that because they went to proof of stake, the Ethereum ETF is less likely to be approved, I personally do not believe this is true at all. And uh, the fact that they went to proof of stake and we all know that it makes them, you know, you know, about on the same level as Hex, but I don't think any regulator will be able to use that argument to reject the ETF at all because the SEC has said nor done nothing in relation to the switch. Oh yeah, no, I do think yeah. they'll they'll approve it, and the ETF providers will own will own the network, um, and that's where that's where it's going to go. Um, and even so, even if they say everything else is a security, I don't know. I think. I think it's going to stay at Bitcoin and ETH for quite some time. I'm not sure if they're going to start going further and further down the code until they've, until they've figured out exactly how they classify every single cryptocurrency. I don't think they'll go any more am, am, ambiguous than Bitcoin and ETH. I think they want to figure out Bitcoin, figure out staking, um, and then make everything else a security and figure out their regulatory regime around it. Oh, man. So I'm, I'm really actually liking your comment here. So you think the... Ethereum ETF is going to be approved, and the the biggest stakers in Ethereum are going to be these financial institutions running the ETFs, and then Vitalik will have to fork the network because he's going to lose total control because of all these exactly. new stakers that are going to completely <laughs> take over. That's hilarious, actually. I can't wait no, for that, that day. But Tun, but Tun, that's that's something that can happen because all these institutes they at the end of the day as simon said they need their own blockchains in the future they will require them for any for uh, one pur purpose or the other and ethereum at this point of time provides them the easiest way to do what they want to do so i do agree with simon that they will approve it and that might be a bigger event <laughs> from what i think might happen in the market that might be a much bigger event than what we'll see next week of uh so yeah i'm looking forward to that one as well i think that's in march right simon for spot ETF for Ethereum. Oh right. Well, um, yeah. I don't know how soon. I think I think they're going to take their time over it because um, I think they've got. No, I think March is the last stick. deadline for that as well. Yeah, I, I reckon they you'll get. I don't, I don't think it'll be approved in March. I think it will be. I think they'll roll those ones over and they'll take the rest of the year on it. There's a lot to figure okay. out because it's so different from Bitcoin. No hundred percent, but 
I think that's that, that suits them better. Like for, for from what I see, I feel that the Ethereum spot ETF suits SEC and BlackRock and all these big firms more than what Bitcoin does. So yeah, I, I'm really curious to see how it works out. Uh, yeah, uh, carry on, Tone. If you had any question, please go ahead. Yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. Sorry, real quick. Um, the, the SEC already approved a bunch of Ethereum futures ETFs, so it's just a matter of time before they do the Ethereum ETFs. I really like what Simon said about Wall Street taking over this proof of stake coin, partly because what in Ethereum there is no minority shareholder protection because the SEC seems like they've given up on trying to classify Ethereum as a security, even though technically it is, but in practice it's not. Um, so because it's not a security, you don't have the traditional minority shareholder protections. So therefore, Wall Street will be able to take over and um, basically take advantage and abuse basically the minority shareholders such as uh, retail i really hope they do uh let's see which way uh you know this thing goes 100 percent. yeah and what, guys, what Alec is, um, he started to already make announcement that ethereum needs to get back to its original vision of decentralization he recognizes that the exchanges own it and so is he gonna it. fork it back to mining is he gonna but fork it back to that would be hilarious man I, I, reckon, I did not I see that gonna... on the complicated roadmap that I posted in the nest from uh, Ethereum's uh, leader, Vitalik Buterin, arguably the de facto CEO. CEO. Yeah, I can't. I can't wait to see what the next, uh, you know, hard fork debate looks like with um, with uh, Vitalik versus BlackRock. It's going to be fun. Yeah, and, and I w just want to be clear. They're, when they launch the Ethereum ETF, those are shares, right? But separately, Wall Street, as they do diligence, and they're going to be smarter than the SEC, as Tone pointed out. Um, I'm not sure everybody at the SEC has no idea what proof of stake is, but probably 99.9% .9 or something. So same difference. Um, but uh, uh, Don't count Street, it, Gary Gansler. Exactly. There is, as Wall there is, um, Street gets into... So, so I'll just be quick. As Wall Street digs into the Ethereum and realizes it's proof of stake, which just looks like shares, they're going to buy a bunch of Ethereum, which is not a security, and then dominate. And that's they're just going to buy real Ethereum and take it over. And right, they, but but you know. but in that but in that time, the price of Ethereum could unfortunately rise quite a bit during that right. hostile takeover. Uh, so well, anyway, we'll 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 see where it goes, and uh, you know we'll um, uh, analyze it as we yeah, as it trends. There's, uh, there's so a lot of governance issues to, uh, to figure out on that one because um, you know, like at the moment, obviously conspiracy theorists say that uh, BlackRock owns every board, and you know he pushed through his uh, Larry Fink pushed through his EC, uh, ESG narrative because because the ETFs own every share of every company in every market to a significant portion uh, they have an element of control over the board decisions um, but however they govern that uh, the similar thing will happen with the ethereum etf they'd have to figure out how they would govern all of these etf unit holders whether they actually get a say in the governance or whether blackrock just uh, does it as a proxy that would that would have to all be figured out in the in the model i i have just one last question uh and uh that's basically we are basically traveling back in time right tone so tone said the market has not priced in etf approval as we saw with the coin telegraph tweet now last week i think we saw a major major dump in price uh i think it was around uh, 10 12 percent uh, because of a report uh, which came out uh, of uh, it was matrix sports report which came out and that the etf approval there's no etf approval and we saw a massive dump in price so taking that into account and taking the taking the coin telegraph tweet uh, way back into account can we say that the volatility of the approval or denial would be somewhere around 10 to 15 percent from what we see with what we have seen with these two tweets I don't agree with that because, um, sorry, back when the Coin Telegraph 
article came out that the ETF was imminent, done deal, whatever. That was unexpected news, right? People were thinking next year, uh, or at least most of us, except for the ones who lost bets like Dom Bay. Hey, Dom, how you doing? Um, and then the the rejection of the ETF or the delay that Matrix uh, came out with, that was also unexpected news. Right now, unless there's news that, that the ETF won't be approved or it gets delayed again, that what everybody expects, if, if the news is what everybody expects, right, that the ETF is approved sometime next week, then it's not a big deal as much. But but that doesn't mean Bitcoin isn't a buy, because I think there is a flood of cash that's coming into Bitcoin, not just into the ETFs where the ETFs have to buy Bitcoin, but also just people who are rich and powerful in the U.S. who have a lot of the 150 50 trillion or so of household net worth. Much of that is liquid. Much of that is in IRAs or 401ks from past employers. They're just going to buy real Bitcoin and self-custody where they can. Um, and I think that's really, really good and not really priced in. Any other takers? Any other uh, point of views? Anything? Tone, uh, Simon? And then if, if none, then we can go to Dombey and he's been trying to become a speaker for a while. I'm sure he yeah. has some inputs. I don't mind just jumping into Dombey. What's up, y'all? Story of my life. Been trying to become a speaker for a while. Um, thanks for having me up. I just have some insights I wanted to share, you know, because a, a little bit ago it came up just as far as pension funds. And for those that are listening in the last year of, of my work has been spent trying to initiate conversations with pension funds uh, just simply for Bitcoin education. So I had a few little takes from that experience just, just to provide some perspective of what I think may, um, you know, what the first few days of an approved ETF may look like for pension funds. Um, you know, originally, it's funny, I saw a post uh, from I think it was Jason or some about Cal Sturz just borrowed 30 billion to avoid selling assets at a significant loss, which would represent, I don't know, close to 10% of their portfolio. I reached out to the office of the CIO uh, in July just to just to come on to the Nakamoto gauntlet to simply run some analysis of what a portfolio uh, allocation would look like. Hypothetical, of course, that was denied. The justification I was given behind the scene was obviously perceived career risk. Um, and so, right, that's that's just that stands on its own there. And, and um, interesting to watch the developments since that denial. And I'm not sure they've looked at it, but but Cal Sturz, for those that don't know, is the second largest public pension um, in the country, coupled with CalPERS, which is number one. Additionally, been trying to hit up a lot of the uh, pension conferences. Uh, and, you know, for the pension trade associations that bring all the pensions together, some really reputable ones. And it's been mixed. Uh, one of the recent responses that I got, um, which I'll just read here, was uh, thank, thank you uh, for reaching out. We feel like your services are much more suited to family office conferences. I don't know of many institutional investors who are investing in Bitcoin. It's not the norm. But I have heard about younger savers liking the option of having Bitcoin within their savings portfolio. With all the recent bad press and limited space in the program, we're focusing on AI far more than Bitcoin at the moment, since it's about to change the entire industry. Um, I thought that was an interesting take. Another um, conference uh, had a different uh, outlook and said that there has been some interest since 2021 in just learning about Bitcoin, but from very much, you know, uh, simply just scratching the surface learning, not not seriously coming to the table saying we want to move money. So ultimately, from my limited vantage point, I think pensions are going to be a very slow moving ship. I think that the negative media that has barraged uh, Bitcoin over the last several years is going to take significant time to unwind, even with the ETF. I think that'll be achieved by heavy marketing. I think it will be achieved by potentially initial pensions that may take the very courageous first step into allocating to a spot ETF. And then over time, if those pension funds, um, you know, outperform other funds that don't have Bitcoin, or we see main, you know, media coverage like pension fund X suffered 
significant losses in their assets in commercial real estate and treasuries, but they did not have to do things like uh, reform their pension fund or move retirement dates back or ask for more allocations from cities because they had a small allocation to Bitcoin that helped float their portfolio through this, these tough times. That's going to spread like wildfire in the space. It's impossible to deny something like that. Um, so, you know, again, I, I think the response from the, the conference uh, organizer that I read just right now is pretty accurate. I know Tone has been saying it in this space uh, that you're going to have people that have already decided that they are committed to Bitcoin and want to invest it, in it, that those people are kind of already set. How much that is, those that work in family offices, maybe private funds and retirement accounts have a better take on what that number is. I still think a small number is going to make headlines and move the needle uh, and do very well. But for, for the side of pensions, I would be shocked to see significant amount of pension funds taking any step towards the Bitcoin ETF for the first several months that it's operating. Uh, and um, but maybe maybe my, my view is like maybe one is ready. Maybe there's one or two. And that would be massive if that occurs based on like their outlook and how much, you know, negative uh uh you know perception that they've been instilled with on bitcoin overall uh thank you dom that was a great perspective uh any questions or any inputs on that tone uh simon well i don't really have any questions or comments thanks for the info dom if the other guys don't maybe we can jump on another topic or uh, just real quick. A... yeah just real quick so anthony pompliano i remember having an, an exchange with him in the past under a different uh, X account. Um, and I said, there's no way pensions will invest in Bitcoin. This was a few years ago. And he said, are you sure? A few weeks later, I had to bite my tongue because he came out and he and his partners got two pensions to invest in Bitcoin through his fund. Um, so I was wrong about that. But then since then, I haven't seen any pensions do anything uh, in the US with Bitcoin. So yeah, Dom's right that if they do that, it'll be news. Although I wouldn't be surprised if just like with Mass Mutual, New York Life in 2020, 2021, when they invested in Bitcoin, that was big news that insurance companies stayed conservative, old, blue blood, uh, reputable insurance companies when they invested in Bitcoin. I thought that there would be a bunch of other insurance companies that followed during the 2021 bubble that didn't really happen seem to peter out and, Ter and terrence that was uh, I was... Oh, okay okay um yeah no i think um i think it's all going to be about that competitive market of outperforming each other and then you have to capitulate because someone else has bitcoin in their portfolio and therefore you know larry fink is going to be pitching the flight to safety especially if we if we push further and further into escalation of wartime economics, um, there's going to be larger portfolios to commodities and Bitcoin will have to take a percentage of that commodity, I think. Yeah, for sure. And, and to Terrence's point, now, you know, if I remember correct, that was the Houston Firefighters Pension Fund and they used a firm to directly hold Bitcoin in a, in a broad basket of different cryptocurrencies. But I can, I can tell you from... That was at the peak of the market and they are still, I'm sure, anytime, you know, the, the conversation comes up, they're referred to as, oh, you know, we're, we're going to do what Houston did and get destroyed on our portfolio holding by a massive drawdown. And so, again, you know, I think it will take time. You will have to see funds uh, because even if a fund does well in the first six months, they're going to say, great, they did well right now. But look what happened to Houston. Uh, you know, it's too, it's too much. We're, we're, we're not interested at this time. And, and some pension funds that get in early are going to have to do sustainably well over a significant amount of period before others jump in. Yeah, that's why I think it makes sense. Um, you've talked about this elsewhere, Don, that about uh, having these union funds, which are not pension funds, but unions with their dues paying members, you guys have like a treasury, right, for the union, and then just limping in with a very small amount that people can't really object to so that if it does 
go from, I don't know, 500 bucks to zero or 2000 bucks to zero. Like who cares? It's not obviously with Bitcoin, it won't, won't do that. But if, if there is an extended bear market, it's like, well, you know, we tried it. It's not a big deal. It's just, you know, a couple hundred bucks or whatever. Whereas if you, if you're a pension, you have to allocate, you can't really limp in like that. Like they're trying to make decisions that are meaningful. So even if they go in at 0.5%, it's still, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars. And that matters because they're being measured on how well their pension is performing against, you know, expected contributions and deficits and so forth. Um, the, the, the liabilities, right? The returns have to keep up with the, the liabilities. So with pensions, I expect them to be one of the, la the last to adopt at scale compared to other institutional entity types. Yeah, it's, you know, a lot of people don't realize CalPERS, the largest pension in the United States, at one point invested in Riot and they made a return. It was so small, it was really insignificant. They made a few million dollars. It was something that somehow landed in their portfolio. They also hold MicroStrategy. A lot of people don't realize that, but at a very small level that doesn't move the needle. Uh, and again, you know, you're mentioning unions holding uh, Bitcoin. We're taking definitely a grassroots approach because there's two issues that are that are significant with pensions. Number one, people that are part of pension funds don't pay attention and there's not much engagement uh, into the decisions being made. So that's something that has to change. And it's something I think that can change through Bitcoin. The more that the participants of a pension or retirement system hold Bitcoin and are doing well, they're going to start asking the questions, why is my fund not not have anything to do with this incredible asset, which has done so well for us? Why, why are we doing this? And they're not even looking at it. And I believe the questions and the pressure will start to mount over, you know, a significant amount of time and start to uh, also add to things that will change the perception alongside of the marketing blitz that could come from the ETFs and some of the early adopters. Perfect. Uh, well, that was a good conversation, guys. Uh, moving on, uh, obviously, we have been in this space for around uh, one hour and 40 odd minutes now, and I have to wrap it up in a bit. So I want to basically end this on a high note, Simon Tone. I want, it's a new year, uh, 2024. Uh, sounds pretty good. All even numbers in there. What do you expect from the market this year? Not just Bitcoin. So we know the narrative in Bitcoin. We know we have, we're going to have ETF approval, we're going to have halving, we're going to have rate cuts and all those things, and it's an election year. But for from the perspective of S&P, from the perspective of NASDAQ, which is already above, which has broken its all-time high, what are you expecting from 2022, uh, 2024, Tony? Uh, so, Milko, so uh, while we still have like 900 listeners, and thank you so much, guys, for joining us on this space, uh, a lot of you joined uh, app later in the space. In the very beginning, we had Joe Colasari here who really broke down uh, what is likely to happen next week. And we really broke down the ETFs and how Grayscale is in a huge disadvantage trying to convert their uh, trust into an ETF. So uh, I think like, like some of the best parts of this conversation took place in the first 45 minutes. So if you weren't here for that, strongly, strongly advise everyone uh, to go back and listen to it. And we will get this up on the Financial Summit YouTube channel as well. Okay, so my view on the markets. Uh, I, I'm going to repeat one more time the thing I said early on, that uh, if we assume that Bitcoin stays at the current price of 43000 or wherever it is right now, uh, right now, the price of Bitcoin is almost 44. If Bitcoin stays at 44,000 going into January 10th, SEC announcement, and again, assuming uh, SEC makes the announcement on the 10th, if that announcement is very positive for Bitcoin ETF approval, I can certainly see Bitcoin going up a substantial amount, up to 50,000 or higher on that announcement, on that bullish announce, positive announcement. But again, if the price of Bitcoin is flat, uh, now, if the SEC delays it, but is very positive speaking that, hey, we have to delay it because we just didn't have our paperwork done. But in March, uh, it's almost certain that they're going to get approved. Then I think Bitcoin will just dip a little bit on the news, similar to what happened a few days ago, and then bounce back and start to consolidate and rise in anticipation of 
March. Now, if the SEC comes out and says, uh, we're denying the ETF and their wording is not very bullish, I can see a much bigger drop with then potential consolidation at the low, and then we go back to the drawing board. However, if the price of Bitcoin rises like crazy with a God candle on Monday and Tuesday, because everyone is absolutely certain that the SEC is going to approve the ETFs, because we've been consolidating for a month. If we do rise, let's say, eight grand uh, before the announcement, I can see the announcement pulling back the price of Bitcoin, even if the announcement is positive, uh, because then there will be nobody left to buy Bitcoin. Everyone will have already been in for the announcement and it becomes a sell the news event. So that is my short term view on Bitcoin. My long term view on Bitcoin is that we are in a bull market. I believe this bull market will be breaking 100,000. Will it be this year or next year? I don't know. But um, I do believe that this bull market will take us to all time highs and very, very likely pass 100,000. What's the ceiling? Uh, the ceiling on this bull market for me is quarter million. I would be very surprised if uh, we end this bull market before another significant drop of 50% or higher uh, after we break quarter mil. That is my ultimate ceiling, uh, but I would be surprised if we get that high. That's kind of my short-term and long-term uh, outlook on Bitcoin. As for the other markets, I am not anticipating a recession. I think the stock market will be rising. I think the interest rate will stay high. Uh, and uh, I still think the price of oil will rise. I think that the price of gold will rise and people will become more and more adversarial between the left and the right, uh, you know, creating more and more conflicts within the United States, uh, more and more conflicts within Europe. Uh, more and more uh, aggression between the West and the East. I see Argentina potentially becoming a bigger mess under Malay than they've been. And that's saying a lot because some of Malay's ideas are brilliant, but his other ideas are even dumber than Karl Marx. So let's see uh, which of his ideas actually went out. Uh, so uh, the world's going to change quite a bit. Uh, the U.S. election is going to cause massive havocs in the markets, uh, but I think people will run away from government bonds like China and Russia has from American government bonds, and uh, they're going to stay clear of government bonds, and gonna, they're going to find safety in private assets like the U.S. equity market, Bitcoin, and gold. Uh, so that's kind of my overall view going into uh, 2024, and uh, the BRICS will get all those members other than Argentina into their system with plans to bring more in. And I think the BRICS is the future uh, looking out 20 years into the future. Thank you, Tone. Uh, well, that was great. Uh, Simon, any last thoughts uh, before we wrap it up for today and uh, see you most probably uh, after the approval? Yeah, um, I agree with pretty much everything that Tone said, actually. Um, I think in, you know, the US and the Fed, the Fed have, have really indicated that they will continue rolling over the Dolly Ponza scheme until it is no more. <laughs> um, and so I'd expect, um, I'd probably expect, I think, um, based upon wartime financing, um, I'd expect some, some rate cuts and a move more to QE. Um, I think the last... So we move into the fifth Bitcoin cycle. The fourth cycle survived inflation and quantitative tightening. It's never had QT or inflation. Um, it survived it. Um, and it also survived a massive fraudulent crackdown. In the next four years, I'd expect it to have to survive wartime economics, the launch of central bank digital currencies, um, a change in, uh, uh, you know, probably longer than four years, but a, a movement towards de-dollarization, um, BRICS becoming bigger, multipolarity across the global south and the global north. Um, you know, I see the dollar eventually going the same way as the pound. Um, I actually think quite extremely, if we're looking at 10 years, 20 years, um, I think the next empire after China 
is likely, I think China would be a very short empire and it will be a technology empire. I actually think we're going to get AI powered central bank digital currencies in the end. Um, I think there's going to be digital IDs and I think America is going to look more and more like China and China is going to look more and more like America and we're going to meet somewhere in the middle with a central bank digital currency. I think we're all going to see this play out in our lifetime over the next 10, 20 years. Um, and I think we do move to more aggressive um, escalations. And, you know, the you, America is going to have to figure out how it deals with the fact that NATO had to retreat and Russia won. Uh, we've got the Middle East side. Uh, we've got the Taiwan reunification with China. We've got North Korea and South Korea starting to um, signal to each other. And the only advice that I can give is thank God for Bitcoin. Uh, make sure that you spend less than you earn and invest the difference. Save the difference in Bitcoin. If you want to put it in an ETF because you're not ready to self-custody yet, put it in ETF, but figure out how to self-custody eventually. Um, and make sure every single month you have more Bitcoin this month than you did the previous month. And I think you'll be watching on the side and helping people that are really going to be struggling in one of the most craziest markets we've seen. That's my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, my, my closing thoughts are self-custody Bitcoin, because that's going to be the currency on Mars if we end up there. If you're listening along, that's the plan. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining today. It was a great space, really, really insightful information coming from each and every one of our speakers. Enjoyed it. And if you haven't already, please visit our website, thefinancialsummit.com. Our next event is going to be in Maldives. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing some of you guys there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Tone. Thank you, Simon. Thank you to all the speakers. Talk to you guys soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Joe, as well. I see him back in the audience. Oh, Dr. Jeff Ross just joined. Wait, if you haven't cut this off yet, uh, we can get his take on the markets. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, Jeff, uh, you want to come up? Dr. Jeff? Dr. Jeff, let's come up. And uh, I tried inviting Joel Kalasari back, but he's probably busy. Uh, let's see how many people we lost. We haven't lost that many. I still see eight, uh, I still see over 900. And uh, yeah, Dr. Jeff, if you want to come up and just give your... We gave our short-term and long-term outlook on the markets, uh, pretty much most markets, as a quick summary. Um, if you could come up, that'd be awesome. Oh, he's dropped off. No, he's still there, uh, but I, he's not accepting yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe it's buggy. Well, you have to say something wrong right that's how you get twitter people to oh here he is he's, i got we got him. we got him we got him. <laughs> hey dr jeff how are you hey morning guys how y'all doing oh shit we got joe too awesome it's been a while we haven't uh had have you you haven't uh, been on the speaker panel uh dr jeff so how are how are you looking at the markets in 2024 what do you expect and uh, where do you see all these uh lovely indices, all the ETF approved, approved Bitcoins uh, sitting at the end of 2024? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, uh, yeah, good good morning. I, I just posted that my, my business uh, that I try not to ever talk about, it just received uh, registration approval, regulatory approval from the state of Texas, which is exciting. That's been, I've literally been battling for like 11 months with compliance stuff, uh, which I hate. Uh, I just like investing. Uh, so anyways, not when I say battle, I mean, I've been paying money for my lawyers to um, put all the paperwork through, as Joe would know. Um, uh, you know, so uh, markets. Okay, first of all, I made a New Year's resolution to not talk about Bitcoin price action, just so you know. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about Bitcoin price action. I think that uh, the price of goods and services are going to forever move lower uh, in Bitcoin terms. And that's all I care about. Um Macro stuff. Uh, so, so you guys know, I, I base all of my macro. I start from a perspective of U.S. net liquidity and global M2 uh, when I'm when I'm uh, paying attention. I think those are what move the markets. I really believe that, and I still do. Um, so, what have we seen recently? Uh, recently, we've seen uh, global M2 has been in the top end of its range. That it's been it's been range bound since April of 2021. Um, and that's that's pretty impressive. Uh, so it just kind of is going crabbing sideways. That's why I've been going by the moniker Dr. Crab, although uh, lately I'm Dr. Bull Crab. Um, so feel free to share that, um, that I'm full of bull crab. Um, but it's in the top end of its range. So I'm waiting. It, tr it looked like it was going to possibly break through right at the end of the year and then it pulled back again. And so so I don't know if that means we're going to it's going to roll over and continue lower or it's going to, you know, make a move and continue to try to move higher. My gut tells me. Well, that no, 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 
Yeah, exactly. You're talking about, you're talking about traditional S and P stocks, right? Here, right now, I'm talking about global M two. Uh, which drives oh, hold on to. Okay, sorry. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so why do I talk about global M2? Because I think it's it's a very strong correlation between the movement of global assets and what global M2 is doing. So if that breaks higher, which I actually expect to happen sometime probably in the first half of 2024, and I think it's going to pick up strength into the second half of 2024, that bodes very well for global assets. I think uh, what, are, what, do, what am I talking about? The most important global asset is Bitcoin. Uh, obviously, um, gold, I think, will do well. I also think that mega cap tech stocks have become global assets. So basically the NASDAQ, um, I think, should do surprisingly well in that scenario. Then the other thing I look at, U.S. net liquidity. U.S. net liquidity has been range bound since April of 2022, um, I believe. So let's see if I'm right on that. Um, hang on. Hold up. Talk, talk amongst yourselves for a second. Um, want to make sure. Yeah, April 2022. Okay, so it's been range bound there. Uh, and it was trying to break higher. And then that pulled back as well. It, it, the, the major reason for the pullback, though, is just sort of end of year window dressing. Uh, the overnight reverse repo market, money market funds basically jammed a bunch of money into there right at the end of the year. And they do that every year at the end of the year and at the end of every quarter. So I was telling people this is a non event. I got blocked by, <laughs> by, uh, um, uh, shoot, right. what's that play? Yeah, zero hedge. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. I'm, How do I'm, I know I'm, we I got blocked by? That's kind of amazing. I spent too much time with you. That's so. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. We're we're like a an old married couple at this point. Um, but yeah, I they they made this this you know doomer prediction that this is terrible and it's an astonishing uh, rise in the overnight reverse repo markets and and I'm like this is just clickbait and and they didn't appreciate that I said that was clickbait and they blocked me anyways so that right after the new year uh, the the overnight reverse repo market went back down and resumed its downward trajectory um, so um, that is generally positive for net liquidity why do I bring all that up because U S net liquidity I believe strongly correlates with the performance of U S based assets, especially U.S. micro caps, small caps, and mid cap stocks. Um, you'll notice that those things were uh, recently hit a local high. That's because, in my opinion, U.S. net liquidity recently hit a local high. It's since turned over, uh, but it but it's hanging out in the upper end of its range. So I'm I'm basically that that's both of those things are a long winded way for me to say I'm basically crabbish right now on both of those assets. So both worldwide assets and US based assets, I think are gonna chop sideways until the trend changes in either net liquidity and or uh, global M2. Um, that's kind of the long answer. Regarding the Bitcoin ETF, obviously I think approval is happening this week. Um, I, by the way, Joe, I put you, I know you responded to my survey. I put that survey out because several prominent people, and I don't wanna name names, were saying they have inside sources who told them that the SEC was going to be making an announcement of an approval on Friday, like uh, yesterday. I don't get where a these lot people. Of them. I don't they, they, get where not, these people come of, off they're... saying that kind of stuff. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, they're they're just trying to get clicks. I mean, it, there was no chance it was coming yesterday. It was obvious. But but one thing you should consider yourself fortunate because one of my cardinal rules of making money is to unsubscribe, unfollow, not listen to anything Zero Hedge says. If you do that, you'll make a lot more money than reading anything they say ever. I actually, I actually agree with that a hundred percent. I think zero head is uh, eighty percent stuff. They just like I like to choose their. Uh, Tone, we are losing you. Yeah, Tone's in the matrix, but I will say, like people like Zero Hedge, there are lots of people like them that make their living with doomer, gloomer, clickbait. And people love that, right? People think it sounds smart to be a doomer and a gloomer. But as Joe likes to point out frequently, and I and I completely agree with, the world, the whole U.S.-based Keynesian economic system, the dollar-based, credit-based system, is is designed to grow in perpetuity. And so, if you bet against the growth of assets, you're gonna be you're gonna lose like nine times out of ten. And so betting that the that the you know the world is going to fall apart and we're heading into a super scary horrible terrible recession and that uh, um, stock markets are going to crash and that Bitcoin's going to go sub 10k, what blah blah blah. That's that you know it sells a lot of clicks. It gets a lot of readership, but it's basically pure nonsense. And so if you follow that, you will be poor and you'll be bitter for the rest of your life, and you'll continue to subscribe to people like them, zero hedge. Uh, because because they're going to say what you want them to say, and you can be bitter together and cynical. Go ahead. Jim. It'd be like going into a casino that's rigged, where the casino always comes up black, and only the rich can bet on black. 
and you're going to bet on red. Like, I mean, come on, like that makes no sense. Well, I wonder didn't how we well miss I'd... Dr. Jeff? Though? Didn't we miss Dr. Jeff? Uh, it, it's it's lovely. Uh, carry on, carry on. So I yeah, I mean, I guess anything. that's my 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 primary macro driver regarding things like interest rates and inflation. I think that inflation is going to sort of settle and chop around at a generally higher level because of structural inflation. But I don't think it's going to have a repeat of the '70s. I see a lot of people posting charts about how we're following the course of the early '70s and we're going to have this little break because the Fed is declaring victory and then and and then inflation is going to spike again. I couldn't disagree more. I absolutely don't think we're going to have another massive spike in inflation unless we have a massive amount of UBI, right? So unless we have basically the U.S. government saying we are going to stuff the checking accounts and savings accounts of Americans like we did post-COVID from our stupid policies, that is what drives consumer price inflation. That's why we had that massive spike. It is not because of structural inflation. It's not because we're you know bringing back, we're domesticating manufacturing in the U.S. That will not cause 10% CPI. I'm just telling you it won't. But, so but we'll get see, that, right? Jeff, you agree with me that we'll get that. I think that comes I, this decade. Uh, I no, Joe. I actually don't. Unless we have UBI, I don't think we get. No, no. I mean another fiscal that. wave. An, another fiscal wave. I think. I think we get that personally. But I think. Well, sure. You, so, like, like in the next cycle, maybe. Like you're talking like late in this decade, possibly. Yeah, 2026. like 2026, 2027. I mean, if you get any rocky environment, you know, the policymakers have realized, hey, all we need to do is mail checks to people. And I don't think it'll be UBI. I think more it'll be another round of checks. And and by the way, this is like the progression of all government programs. Like, you know, the, the, the checks, the stimulus checks that went out during COVID, they weren't the first stimulus checks. We actually had stimulus checks go out under Bush like 20 years ago. They were smaller. I think they were like 200 bucks or 150 bucks or something really ridiculously small. Um, everything gets bigger. Everything gets larger. Everything gets, instead of like a one-off, it becomes more repeated and regular and continual. And then, then, then you get the transition where it's like, wait a second, rather than sending it out every six months or every 12 months or every two years, why don't we just send it out every month? That's UBI. Hey, Joe, what triggered it under Bush? I didn't know that. Uh, slowdown. Post, post 9-11. You had a, a slowdown. They mailed yep. checks to people. And, you know, that was I, I, so. So this is always the progression, right? It's it's creep. It's institutional creep. Uh, you, 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 you mission creep, whatever the term is. Um, you, you, you start out small and then it becomes uh, continual and then it becomes, you know, just something. Oh, yeah. Why don't we just do it every month? Yeah. So no, this time they can incentivize them into a digital ID and distribute it through an experimental CBDC as well. Yeah, I think those are actually very reasonable hypotheses, and I think they actually have a, a pretty high chance of happening. And if that does happen, then yes, I would expect. See, I'll, I'll be out here uh, whining and crying like I was post-COVID when they were talking about uh, you know putting money in everybody's bank accounts and shutting down industry at the same time. I, I was like, this is going to cause a massive spike in CPI, and it's actually going to the second order consequences, the unintended consequences are going to be much worse than this current little gift we're getting. Uh, and we saw that. And, and so, yes, if that does happen, and if we do get another wave of fiscal stimulus like that directly into the bank accounts of Americans, then absolutely, I expect CPI to spike again. But until that happens, and this is my point, until that happens, we will not. I think we're going to have this kind of generally lower level inflation and we're going to have com uh, commensurate low uh, rates right so interest rates i expect the 10-year yield to probably be kind of chopped around from three and a half to maybe five and a half uh, percent for 2024 it's not going to be exciting at all it's going to be just basically dead wasted money um and 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 that's not that's definitely not the place to be so that's my general macro outlook uh kind of unexciting i don't think we get a massive recession unless something comes out of left field right like major a uh, major war kind of announcement or the cybersecurity event that the waf continues to uh um prophesy uh is going to happen it's possible it happens right it's possible uh they say china or russia or somebody and maybe it's maybe it's uh, the U.S. doing it to itself. Who knows? Um, but some major cybersecurity event that would rock the markets like that would definitely be uh, deleterious for sure to basically all risk assets. But, you know, you can't predict when that kind of stuff is going to happen. So you got to live life like it's not going to happen. Those are my views. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Uh, it was great having you on the spaces again. And uh, really looking forward to the next spaces and hopefully that's going to be post uh, ETF approval and we'll have a lot to talk about after people would have gone through the prospectus of the ETFs that have been approved and what to expect and what not to expect. Uh, thanks all for joining. Uh, looking forward to talking to you guys in the coming week.